Hey guys, let's continue in the book of Amos as Amos has exposed the injustices. He has called them into lament and repentance and he's warned those who are unresponsive, the complacent, with the prophetic woe. Uh, we're going to look at chapter 7 and the beginning part of chapter 8. I just want to brace ourselves a little bit for what we're about to read. There's a couple things we get to bear witness to. One is we actually get to see a real interaction between Amos and the religious political elite in his day. We actually have a little chunk of dialogue where we get to see how Amos is interacting and how are these guys responding to his message. We haven't really got an indication of that so far. So that'll be fun to look at. And the other thing I wanted to warn you about is the visions. Yeah, you might be thinking of... But prophetic visions are pictures. Prophetic visions help us to capture a little bit of what is in God's mind and how is he going to convey how he sees things to the people. And he does so in a way that's very evocative and images can help us understand a little bit of what God is thinking. So before we continue, I actually have an activity for you. You actually get to make one of these images. So if, if you would, I want you to pause the video in just a second. But before that, I want you to find something heavy, something heavy that you could tie a rope through, you know, or tie a rope onto. I mean, it could literally be a spoon or something like that, your fidget spinner, and tie a rope to it. And I want you to go ahead and do that. Find something kind of weighted and tie a rope to the top. Are you ready? Set. Go. <laughs> We're going to talk about what this is and why I'm asking you to do this. But in the meantime, it's something to put in your hands and have a little fun with. Right? Guys, enjoy your plumb line. Don't hit yourself in the face with it. I don't know why I said that, but just a fear of mine that I'm going to like show you this. And it's kind of like, you know, um, that would hurt. Picture the visions of Amos. I'm excited. Okay, so let's read Amos chapter 7, verse 1 through chapter 8, verse 3. I'm going to read from the NLT. The Sovereign Lord showed me a vision. I saw him preparing to send a vast swarm of locusts over the land. This was after the king's share had been harvested from the fields and as the main crop was coming up. In my vision, the locusts ate every green plant in sight. Then I said, O oh, Sovereign Lord, please forgive us or we will not survive, for Israel is so small. So the Lord relented from this plan. I will not do it, he said. Then the Sovereign Lord showed me another vision. I saw him preparing to punish the people with a great fire. The fire had burned up the depths of the sea and was devouring the entire land. Then I said, O oh, Sovereign Lord, please stop or we will not survive, for Israel is so small. Then the Lord relented from this plan too. I will not do that either, said the Sovereign Lord. Then he showed me another vision. I saw the Lord standing beside a wall that had been built using a plumb line. He was using a plumb line to see if it was still straight. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? I answered, a plumb line. And the Lord replied, I will test my people with this plumb line. I will no longer ignore their sins. The pagan shrines of your ancestors will be ruined, and the temples of Israel will be destroyed. I will bring the dynasty of King Jeroboam to a sudden end. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is hatching a plot against you right here on your very doorstep. What he is saying is intolerable. He is saying Jeroboam will soon be killed and the people of Israel will be sent away into exile. Then Amaziah sent orders to Amos. Get out of here, you prophet. Go on back to the land of Judah and earn your living by prophesying there. Don't bother us with your prophecies here in Bethel. This is the king's sanctuary and the national place of worship. But Amos replied, I'm not a professional prophet and I was never trained to be one. I'm just a shepherd when I take care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord called me away from my flock and told me, go and prophesy to my people in Israel. Now then, listen to this message from the Lord. You say, don't prophesy against Israel. Stop preaching against my people. But this is what the Lord says. Your wife will become a prostitute in the city and your sons and daughters will be killed. Your land will be divided up and you yourself will die in a foreign land. And the people of Israel will certainly become captives in exile far from their homeland. Then the Sovereign Lord showed me another vision. In it, I saw a basket filled with ripe fruit. 
What do you see, Amos? He asked. I replied, A basket full of ripe fruit. Then the Lord said, Like this fruit, Israel is ripe for punishment. I will not delay their punishment again. In that day, the singing in the temple will turn to wailing. Dead bodies will be scattered everywhere. They will be carried out of the city in silence. I, the Sovereign Lord, have spoken. Woo! Okay, there's actually one more vision in the book of Amos, but we just went through four big ones. And then this dialogue here in the middle of it between another prophet and Amos, having very disparate views on what's happening. So let's engage the imagery. So the first one, God is going to send locusts. Do you guys think of anything in particular when you see locusts? You might be thinking of the plagues in Egypt, right? This is a, this is a big deal. Like this is an act of judgment against an oppressive nation in the Exodus account. And here we have God using it against his own people. Now Amos actually talks God out of this. And I know this is interesting, guys. Maybe I've mentioned this before, but guys, did you know that prayer has an effect? Do, do you see here that God relented? Some translations even say God changed his mind. So any theology that we build up that somehow leaves out God responding to humanity's cry is just not biblical. So yes, Amos is like, no, please not this. And God's like, fine. Another vision. A fiery drought is what the subtitles say about this one. So a fire that dries up even the depths of the ocean. This is, this is terrifying, right? I don't know. If I was Amos, I'd be like, no, no, no. I'm good with the locusts. Uh, at least you can eat them like protein. Don't send the fire. Yeah, you know, th this is this is how severe this is, right? This covenantal apocalyptic kind of judgment on Israel because they're that far away from from doing God's will as a people, even though they were in covenant relationship with Him. So please don't forget the covenant context of this: that God is only doing what He would say He would do if they broke covenant. Now, Amos prays again: God, please don't. And what does it have? It has God relented again. Again, some translations say God changed his mind. So I, I just want to say that as scary as these scenes of judgment are, as much as we should take seriously God's wrath, I do want us also to take seriously God's mercy and responsiveness to our prayer. The third vision. So did you did you make your plumb line? That's what I had you make. Uh, a plumb line is simply a weight. You drape down a wall or something you're building, like a stack of bricks or whatever, and it just helps you see what's straight. So you know, you put this at the top of a wall. Did I build my wall straight? And God is dangling this above a wall, and he's saying, hey, Amos, I'm going to measure. I'm going to make sure that things are built right here. It's interesting at the end of the passage that God points out the altars. And I think we've engaged this quite a bit during this exploration of Amos. But let's just remember exactly what this country, Israel, was founded on. So... This country was founded on idolatry, right? That that as soon as Jeroboam the, the first was given uh, this inheritance, that hey, you know, God ordained this kind of shift between uh, one kingdom under the Davidic kingdom. He, we're actually going to separate a little bit. He didn't wait. He filled in the blanks with his own program of religious orthodoxy, and it plunged the whole nation and its subsequent history into idolatry. How could it be that powerful that, that, that one king set up this system that would affect generations and generations and generations, all the way down to Amos' generations, where they find themselves out of sync with God? How could this happen? Well, guys, it happens at the foundation. And if the foundations 
are not level, then everything we build on top of it is going to be precarious, warped, twisted. You know, I, I just, I just want to scale this principle a little bit into today's moment, where in many ways I feel like America is in a bit of an identity crisis. And personally, I don't see anything wrong with having an identity crisis because it invites us to, to stay humble, right? Uh, and to seek God. And I think that's the occasion that could have happened here in Israel, that being aware of where they're out of sync with God, that they don't measure up to his plumb line, that they haven't built a system that's upright is a moment where they can actually in humility admit that and come to God. And as we'll see in the, the scene between Amos and this other prophet, that's not the posture. But what about our posture, right? So, as America has an identity crisis of sorts, we can be asking the same question. Are there anything that our founding fathers baked into the bread that at the foundational level was broken and crooked. We've got stolen land, Native American genocide, slavery. Let's examine our own crooked foundations, shall we? The doctrine of discovery was a European tool. It was a theology in which white European Christians could take any land they saw fit. It is no surprise then that these white Europeans who sought religious freedom actually began the genocide of the native peoples. And we've all heard of the horrors of the transatlantic slave trade in which Christians justified the dehumanizing of black men and women. And obviously this institution had a ripple effect that we're still coping with. The foundations on, of our country are also crooked from the start. And so what happens um, when we measure the plumb line? I stole my baby's blocks for this. I borrowed my baby's blocks for this. And um, let's just see. So a plumb line, right? You, you're dangling from the wall and you're trying to see what's straight. And if you don't build things straight or if the bottom is crooked, you know what happens. It comes tumbling down. Might not be as dramatic as I want it to be because this, these rubber baby blocks. But you get the idea. If this thing behind me is a parkway bridge pillar, by the way. If this thing wasn't set up straight, that whole structure above me could come crumbling down. So before we move on, and as we're engaging the imagery of these visions, I think it's worth asking, while the plumb line seeks to find what is crooked, do we find our identity, church, on the right foundations? And I think you know from Scripture what the foundation we're looking for is Christ. He is our cornerstone. He is the thing upon which we rest. If we build ourselves and our self-identity and our corporate identity and our sense of, of everything off of the wrong foundations, off the crooked foundations of our own uh, nationhood, then, then we're missing something very important, which is we've built ourselves upon the wrong foundation. And so while we can responsibly navigate the identity crisis that the country is having, we can, at the same time, probe our foundations and build them upon the one true cornerstone that will help us be upright. And so just pause there, guys, build your identity on nothing less than the foundation of Christ Jesus and the kingdom of God. And I don't think you'll be disappointed with that. Everything you build on top of that it's stuff that will last. It's stuff that will stand. It's a preview of the kingdom come. So let's build on that foundation. So then he confronts this other prophet, Amaziah, right? Or rather, this other prophet confronts him. Yo, uh, stop badmouthing our king. We're like legit. Like we're above rebuke. I don't, I don't know what you're doing here. Quit that. Do you, do you never notice how people in power... And authority uh, don't want things to, to change. They, they want to keep things the way they are. They want to preserve the status quo. It's no different in ancient Israel than it is today. Even, even people in religious positions of, of authority, you look at it in Jesus' day, they didn't want to be confronted with their shortcomings and failures. 
For some reason, they wanted to enshrine their pride and to keep critical voices away. And so the prophet comes to rebuke that. And how you respond to the prophet is key. Remember, we've talked about this. Jesus is, in fact, a prophet as well. And what, how we respond to the teachings of Jesus, inviting us into humility, inviting us into to living cruciform lives, lives shaped by the cross, how we respond to that, well, let's not be like Amaziah who shielded his whole identity from being rebuked. Let us practice dying to self and self-denial and the humility and even humiliation of following a crucified Lord. So don't get your defenses up when people start talking about the injustices in the world. It's okay to weep and mourn and lament and to acknowledge that the world is broken and that we, in a way, play a role in that. Even if you live pridefully and you feel like, you know, there's nothing to see here. Why are people complaining about all these issues? Like, maybe for the American church, here's some issues we could talk about because they're real. And if we resist having those conversations, we stand in the tradition of Amaziah, who doesn't want to have the conversation about the injustices in his kingdom. And so may it be even more true that people who found themselves on Christ, that we are capable of having conversations about the tough things that prevent the church from living out this amazing, beautiful picture that God had planned from the beginning, a place where things are upright. So don't shy away from the conversation. Don't be Amaziah. It's not amazing to be Amaziah. I don't know. Does that make sense? All right, and then there's this, uh, this last image. So image four, vision four. So sorry, I'm going to nerd out. There's a wordplay, and, and I love this because Amos is, he's an orchardist, right? He deals with sycamore figs. He, he helps fruit ripen. And there's this wordplay in the Hebrew, and it's a play on, on the word like the end of the harvest and, and the summertime uh, fruit. Translators have translated this, the time, is, the, the time is ripe. It's a pun, and there's a pun in the Hebrew too, and it's a little different. So I just, I love that wordplay is able to preserve. time is ripe, right? So I, I should have brought a, a fruit basket out here of, of, of fruit that's ready to eat. And so what we have here is a sense of urgency. That the time for them was ripe. It was ready. We need to have this conversation. It is time. It is time. I think in the spirit of Amos, we can approach conversations related to the injustices that we perpetuate with the same sense of urgency. The time is now. The time is ripe. So guys, I, I hope this exploration of Amos' visions give you occasion to realize a couple of things. One, the responsiveness of God, that, that he would, would respond to Amos' pleas and shift direction. Another thing to, about the visions is the severity of what's going on. This idolatrous injustice that is rampant and Northern Kingdom Israel occasioned some very harsh judgment oracles against Israel through these visions. And I think we need to take God's heart for justice seriously. And perhaps the third thing we can learn is that it's possible, it's very, very possible for us to calcify against those who are pointing out injustice. And I'm tired of hearing about, insert that issue, right, Amaziah was tired of hearing about the injustices in Northern Kingdom Israel. Just stop, Amos. Well, here's the thing. Amos won't stop, and Jesus won't stop. And Jesus won't stop until the kingdom that he sees envisioned, the kingdom that measures up to his plumb line, it's going to be here. It's going to be on the right foundations. There will be an upright manifestation of the kingdom of God here and in the, in, in the new heavens and new earth are fully realized, the time is ripe. 
Don't be Amaziah. Don't harden your heart against the pleas of those who are pointing out the injustices of our day and asking the church to be rebuked, humbled, and become agents of reconciliation through Christ Jesus. All right, let's be inspired. Let's be inspired by Amos and his courage at helping everyone around him see that God takes seriously poor foundations. Build yourself on Christ the rock and nothing less, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Godspeed.